Blue Apron is the leading meal kit delivery service in the U.S. And while many know what they do, not many know about the types of meals you eat when you cook with Blue Apron. Now tell me how these sound. Chili butter steaks with lemon parmesan butter and potatoes. Vegetable lo mein with bok choy and carrots. Spicy shrimp bucatani with cabbage and toasted breadcrumbs. Roasted chicken and maple butter with sweet mashed potato and collard greens. Blue Apron delivers fresh pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step recipes right to your door. They can be cooked in under 45 minutes. The menu changes every week based on what's in season and is designed by Blue Apron's in-house culinary team. Blue Apron offers 12 new recipes each week. Customers can pick two, three, four recipes based on what best fits their schedules. And Blue Apron sends only non-GMO ingredients in meat without added hormones. Blue Apron is treating our listeners on the right time to their first three meals free. A $30 value when you first order if you visit blueapron.com slash Bomani. So check out this week's new menu and get your $30 off with free shipping at blueapron.com slash Bomani. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Want an easy way to see if you could save money on car insurance? Geico gives you three. Call 1-800-947-AUTO. Go online to geico.com or stop by the Geico office nearest you. Three ways you could save 15% or more. Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. So yesterday I was out. Uh, it was about the one o'clock hour. I'm going somewhere to watch for football. And I got a text that was like, you see this thing about Jerry Richardson? And I'm like, nah, send me a link on Jerry Richardson. And I get the Sports Illustrated story about Jerry Richardson. And I'm like, whoa, like this broke right around kickoff? So imagine that, Jerry Richardson at the game, in his suite, whatever it is. And Sports Illustrated has dropped a bombshell report on him that talks about, among other things, four former Panthers employees who got confidential settlements based on inappropriate things that had happened at the workplace. It talked about a racial slur that had been directed at one African-American scout from the Panthers. Uh, and then they talked about, what was it, Jeans Day on Friday, where everyone would wear jeans to the office, and Jerry Richardson would come and make comments to women um, based on the jeans that they had. Shannon Wells, was, was it uh, the Mr., right? Everybody at the Everybody calls him Mr.? An organization call him, refer to him as Mr. Yeah. Not Miss, not Mr. Richardson, to be clear, right? Just Mr. Like the color purple. Well, not exactly like the color purple, but like the color purple. They just call him Mr. Like it sounds like this wild, antiquated sort of workplace. Then there were more details, like the idea that, um, they said uh, allegedly Richardson would have an assistant like walk a woman to his suite and then he would get there and say things to him like you know i would love to shave your legs like you would love to shave their legs like that that's what we're doing here right so all of this happens after the game jerry richardson puts out a statement saying that he will in fact be selling the team but the statement of course made no level of apology for any of the allegations that were there in the report so if you were wondering when what's happening all over the rest of the world would get a little bit closer to sports, this is the moment where it has happened, right? Like it gets to an NFL team owner. I don't think there's anybody at this point who can be surprised to hear about any sector of life where this sort of thing comes to because this thing comes to kind of just like attitudes men have toward women and they're pretty pervasive everywhere. But now this has come to a place where like on the airwaves here and stuff like that, we wind up talking about it. I want to know who got Jerry Richardson on the phone that afternoon and was like, hey, we got this statement right here about how you're going to sell this team. Because you have to say today that you are going to sell this team. And shortly after that, you are probably going to need to say that you are not going to be involved in the day to day for this. And here's the reason the NFL is saying right now that they are going uh, the Panthers had an, an internal investigation that was going on about Richardson. The NFL then took over that internal investigation as it has gone on. And I would imagine that the NFL would love nothing more than for Jerry Richardson to be long gone by the time the details of that investigation become clear. Or they would just like this to move fast enough that by the time they probably should have had an investigation, you might have forgot about it and moved on to something else. Because at that moment, they don't have to reckon with it. And the reckoning part of it as it comes to the NFL and where this gets to be interesting is what you do here effectively becomes the template if you have to do something else with some other team. You see what I mean? So dealing with this and whatever comes down, you got to deal with it, but you've got to keep in mind that whatever happens somewhere else that comes up is going to wind up having to be dealt with also. Now, for the NFL, 32 owners, right? 
I am not in a position here to say anything about how the owners get down on this. The Richardson story winds up being kind of two pronged. Because one thing I noticed, and Shannon, you tell me if you noticed this in the in the mentions, like on the Twitter mentions, because I noticed this. I had people who hit me up saying they wanted to talk about Jerry Richardson and the matters of gender involved. And then I had people hit me up and say they wanted to talk about Jerry Richardson as the racist owner. It was almost like a like a a, 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 a ink blot test, right? On what people focus on. Like, did you notice that split? Absolutely. It was. It seemed it was weird because it seemed like folks wanted to focus on one or the other. Right. But see, for the NFL, now you got both. Right. So if you have someone who feels they have been treated improperly at the workplace on the basis of race, then this is going to become the template for how that gets dealt with. If you had these issues of sexual harassment then this becomes the template of how to be dealt with. And who are the people who are going to ultimately be behind determining what the course of action is on this? The other owners. Now, to a degree, we are asking those other owners, at least some of them, one might presume, to pick their own switch. Right? Because whatever happens to the Panthers, if you are in a similar situation, then that's going to come down on you, wherever it is. You remember when... um. What was it uh, with Donald Sterling? When the NBA ran Donald Sterling out of there. And remember, they ran Donald Sterling out of there for something very, very particular, right? What those statements were that he got caught saying to the woman that then got broadcast. They didn't get him for, like, the overall culture. Keeping in mind, there have been allegations that Donald Sterling was bringing people to watch the dude shower. And all the things that Sterling had been alleged to have said at all these different points. They didn't get him for that. They got him for that one particular thing. And getting him for that one particular thing kind of made it easy for him to a degree because you couldn't go and look at every other team and see how they get down and then say, okay, this is what we're going to do. They were like, no, we're getting you for this one thing. If they're going to get the Panthers or Richardson, whoever it is, for the larger culture that's there, then all these teams understand that their cultures are open doors for the league if they want to give some level of punishment. So then if you are the owners, how do you decide what this punishment is? You're picking your own, like I say, they get to pick their own switch. How are they going to do it? But oh, is it Mark Cuban? You remember when Mark Cuban did that interview where he was trying to explain that all of us have our impulses on rate? You know, like he said, if I see a white dude with a face full of tattoos or a black kid with a hoodie, I'm going to be scared either way. And we need to understand and have a dialogue and a conversation or anything. That was one of those because he was like, no, we shouldn't take Donald Sterling's team. Because he's like, hey, man, you never know when that mirror, at least it felt like, you never know when that's going to spin back around, and you never know when it's going to hit you. So what's the NFL going to do? In the end with this, what are they going to do? Not sure. I'd also like to point out something else that's very interesting. Shane, did you, did you notice this? It doesn't seem like anybody was able to get a microphone in Jerry Richardson's face or any other suit's face, so they had to come talk to the rank and file. Football players and the coach. And I can imagine that's probably the last thing that Jerry, that uh, Ron Rivera wanted to talk about. Also, think about it from this standpoint, too, right? So, like, all companies have their public relations wings or whatever, right? And you send the publicists out to take the bullets for everybody. That's not what happens in sports. We send the players and we send the coaches out there to talk about these things. And what does that mean when we talk about the Carolina Panthers? That's right. We need to get an answer from Cam Newton. Now, I imagine that there had to be some public relations person with the Panthers whose job it was to try, try to get, like, Cam, like, what, what we're going to try to do. But also, Shannon, what do you do if you're the public relations person? Because as of right now, you still work for Jerry Richardson. Right? At the same time, I'd imagine that you you, you give uh, Cam the heads up and try to keep it as vague as possible. Yeah, but also keep in mind, this happened during, on game day. Right? So it's not like they had all night to sit Cam home with some flashcards or something to think about this or whatever. No. They're catching him after the game wearing that ridiculous hat in those shades. Like, nobody told him, hey, Cam, we're going to have to talk about some serious stuff, man. You might want to take that uh, Aladdin hat off there. Nope. He's up there with the Aladdin hat. Didn't he have some, like, funny-looking glasses? Like, could have been, like, from Tom Petty into the Great Wide Open video. They had, like, a tent to him. But anyway, there's Cam. Uh He was up there, and you could tell as he started talking, like, Man, I hope I don't mess this up. Play the first one. I heard about it, but I haven't, you know, really dug into it. Um, and I just recently, you know, seen the, the internal investigation about all that. But, you know, one thing about it, man, um, you know, Mr. Richardson has been an unbelievable source in my life. You know, I can't really speak on nobody else, but I have conversations that because in my life, it's hard for me to kind of talk to certain people with them not being able to understand where I'm coming from. And I found a place of um, 
a refuge, you know, with Mr. Richardson. Shannon, I want to know what exactly it is that he and Jerry Richardson are like right here on where the only person he feel like he could talk to about some of these things is Jerry Richardson. Like, Mr. Richardson, you see that episode of Atlanta last night? Right, right, right. right. Well, when this camp just come in there and be like, you know what I love? A big, sumptuous biscuit from Hardee's. <laughs> right? like, I, just, I can't imagine the camp's just up there like, what am I supposed to do right now? Right? Because I don't – you, I, I just got off work. Like, what am I supposed to say about Jerry Richardson right now? Hold on. He had more. That's what's very serious. That's something extremely serious right now, especially when you see so many people getting picked out because of the things that they've done in their in the past. So, you know, I don't take that lightly. I was just telling you my personal experiences Mr. with Mr. Richardson and how he has had such an, uh, a father-like role to a lot of players in that locker room that's present and, you know, uh, past. So uh, for me, um, I hope, you know, things doesn't alter my, my thinking of Mr. Richardson. But for what I do know, man, he's given, you know, me some things that, you know, I just will forever be appreciative for him. I'd have gone with no comment. Like, I feel like for all y'all, no comment is probably the play. Like, I do think people have to be fair to appreciate the degree of impossibility in the situation. Your boss just got hemmed up in, like, super-duper scandal. Uh, what exactly are you supposed to say about that Right now, in front of all these people, Shannon, uh, Thomas Davis was like, uh, well, Mr. Richardson had always been good to me. Well, damn, they just fired the general manager a little while ago because he wasn't being nice enough to you because Jerry Richardson did not like it. Like, yeah, that's probably what he's going to wind up saying. Meanwhile, Jerry Richardson is just like, man, let me just try to get out of here right fast before y'all stop and really stop and think about you were at work asking women if you could shave their legs. And every other trick that was in the book. And now it, we'll see how this one plays. How about that? The right time with Bomani Jones. Just one thing, by the way, uh, to mention about Jerry Richardson. One thing that's kind of been lost in this, in the whole time that Richardson has owned this team, um, it's kind of a wonder that they let him buy the team in the first place. Or, you know, like this, some things weren't dealt with sooner. Don't forget, Jerry Richardson was the CEO of the company that ran Denny's when Denny's caught their discrimination suit in the 1990s. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, but are familiar with the Jay-Z catalog, never eat at Denny's with party at Lil Penny's. That is what he was talking about in that one. It's to a degree a wonder that he got here. So at least on the basis of allegations of like workplace racism, there's not that much of a surprise there, given that the man had run a company that had already had dealt with one of those. The stuff, though, as it related to dealing with women was staggering, though. It was just absolutely 100% staggering. And when this stuff comes up, I feel like a lot of men are just like, yo, I don't, I don't even know if I can say hello to a woman anymore. I was like, okay, well, maybe you don't know if you can say hello to a woman. That's fine. Maybe you're unaware of whether you can do that. But just in case you didn't know before, no, you cannot ask a woman if you can shave her legs. No, no, you are not allowed to ask women to show you their jeans so you can see uh, how they fit at work and offer them foot massages and the likes. No, you can't do that. Just in case you were curious. I'm just trying to help. Did I do straight talk? Yes. Cool. All right. Uh, anyway, last night, because there was attention to be gotten. Your man Diddy looked up and saw people talk about the Carolina Panthers are going to be for sale because Jerry Richardson is going to sell the Carolina Panthers. And, of course, that meant that Diddy said that he would think about buying the Carolina Panthers. And then that led to Diddy doing a video to express the fact that he would like to buy the Carolina Panthers. And it went like this. Okay, y'all, this is just in breaking news. The North Carolina Panthers. Wait, press pause. Okay. Press pause. North Carolina Panthers. Did he say what I think he said? Yes, the North Carolina Panthers, yes. Okay, keep going. Okay, y'all, this is just in breaking news. The North Carolina Panthers, okay? North Carolina Panthers are up for sale. I believe it's time to turn the franchise over to new ownership. Well, I need to send a message out to everybody in the beautiful state of North Carolina. I will be the best NFL owner that you can imagine. I will immediately address the Colin Kaepernick situation and put him in a running for next year's starting quarterback. It's just competition, baby. It's just competition. But also, I will have the best halftime show, 
the best selection of music, and we will win. Okay, so here's the thing about the best halftime show. Shannon, you want to guess who will be the performer at the halftime show? Because I got to guess. I don't know exactly who's going to be if, uh, if Diddy's involved. The halftime performer is Diddy. Yes, it is Diddy. Perhaps Hologram Biggie. But definitely Diddy is going to be the halftime performer. I also feel like he does not realize that if you want to curry the favor of Carolina Panthers fans, saying we bring Colin Kaepernick in when you got Cam Newton isn't the way to do it. Not so much because they love Cam Newton so much, but if they don't like Cam Newton that much, what the hell you think they're going to have to say about Colin Kaepernick? Although I would love to see Shannon, the postgame uh, videos of those two walking out in, they, in their gear after the game, with Cam Newton out here dressed like Willy Wonka and Colin Kaepernick out here wearing his Eldridge Cleaver suit. With Colin trying to pass these books over to Cam. Like, look, man, you need to read The Wretches of the Earth. All right, can you imagine the locker room split that would develop if you had Cam and Kaepernick in there at the same time? Can you imagine that? He's saying it was just competition, baby. What does he think this is, the band? Yeah, well, that's the other thing, too. Like, you know, they actually have a thing. Like, And also, my first order of business is to bring Colin Kaepernick back. Diddy, this ain't. No, this isn't how this works at all. The other part of it, though, Panthers would be signing the worst contracts ever. Like, what you mean I signed over all my publishing? <laughs> I said, the Panthers would be the first team signed to do the 360 deals. Right, it all can get jerked. Like it's a record industry, dude. All of these cats will wind up getting jerked. The North, and again, the North Carolina Panthers. Is there anything more New York than having no concept of anything outside of New York in the way that he did, say, in the North Carolina Panthers? That's the most New York thing he possibly could have said. Because they are trying to figure out who it is that might buy this team. And an interesting question is going to be like what the valuation of the team is going to prove to be. Now, one point I want to make on Jerry Richardson, because I've heard people talk about this, and I think it's something to kind of consider, that um, I think when things like this happen, people want to see some measure of punishment. They want to see people suffer. Like one thing about, I think, the social media and everything else is that it's kind of empowered people in such a way where they have at least the feeling that they have more control over the adjudication of these matters than they ever did before. So with somebody like Jerry Richardson, the same way it was with Donald Sterling, it's like, okay, now we got a chance to make this rich person pay. Except the problem is, in a circumstance like this, you can't really make the rich person pay because the only way that you can make the rich person pay is to pay the rich person. So the idea that Jerry Richardson, who paid however many hundreds of millions of dollars for the team in the first place might have to sell it for uh, what Forbes valued the team at $2.3 billion. I believe it was $2.3 billion. So they're like, Oh man, you're really punishing this old man uh, by giving him $2.3 billion, except for the fact if he wanted that $2.3 billion, he'd have sold the team already. All right. Like Jerry Richardson, uh, Jonathan Jones of sports illustrator wrote a very good column about this, about the way that Jerry Richardson is so consumed with his own legacy. Like that's the big thing to him is his own legacy. This is a man that has, uh, two statues built of him while he's still alive, one in front of the stadium and one at Wofford college. He has his name all over the place. Like he believes in the, he is big into the weight of the Richardson name. He wants it to carry on for a very long time. And what is happening here is actually for a guy like Jerry Richardson, maybe the worst thing that could happen because he really cares about what his legacy is in that way. Now, you could obviously make the easy argument that if he cared about his legacy, he wouldn't have done those things. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand what you're saying. I'm saying that having the name sullied bothers him. He never thought that stuff was ever going to be the thing to do it. But the idea of taking his team away from him, like with Donald Sterling, Donald Sterling's thing was he never wanted to sell anything. So forcing him to sell something was as close to a punishment as you were going to get. But the bottom line is you ain't never going to really hurt rich people, right? Like like that, like they got the whole game built up to even when they hurt, it don't hurt that bad. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. All guests join us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line, just like our next guest. He covers the NFL at ProFootballTalk.com, works out of Charlotte. His name is Darren Gant. Now, Darren, we just saw that uh, Jerry Richardson has given up the day-to-day operations of the Carolina Panthers after after the Sports Illustrated report this weekend about the workplace and the environment right. for the Panthers. Um, are you surprised that he's walked away so easily without a fight? Makes you wonder what else is in there, doesn't it? Yeah, like that was, I mean, because this, this, I mean, just, I think this is a part that you could clarify is how important being the owner of the Carolina Panthers is to him. Oh, I mean, it's central to his, I mean, he cares very much about his legacy and his place in the world. I mean, this is a man 
I, I can tell you about I mean, I've sat in his house uh, when he's taken calls. He enjoys the fact that powerful people call him Mr. He cares very deeply about how he's perceived. And, and running that team is central to what he's about and, and who he believes he is. And to give it up, I, I think it is. It's troubling, and it makes me wonder what else is to be uncovered. And, you know, to be honest with you, I think the – the sexual harassment allegations are very serious. I don't mean to diminish that in any way. And that got everybody's attention because of hashtag me too. The racial stuff I think is probably as big or bigger reason is that he's stepping away as quickly as he is. Cause that's a problem that hurts him on a day to day basis running that team. Because if you believe what's in that report from sports illustrated, and I've been given no reason to suggest that you shouldn't believe it then I think it's reasonable for Julius Peppers to walk up there and say, you think that about me? Or for Thomas Davis to say, you think that about me? And you can't own a football team if that's going around. Well, how aware, I guess, or were you surprised as someone who'd been around the organization with these allegations? I'm not going to tell you I saw it, but I tell you what I did see over the last you know, 20 years being around this market and being around that team. He's an 81-year-old white man from the South. And he says things and he believes things based on a certain context that you only get being a white man from the South of a certain generation. And I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that he has said in the past and a lot of people, things they've talked about him, are probably in his mind innocent or at least not malicious. And he just doesn't, you know, he can understand how it sounds to people who grew up in a different context, who grew up in a different time or grew up in a different place because, um, you know, it is. It's it's just a very old South way of thinking he has and has always had. All right, talking to Darren Gander, ProFootballTalk.com, here on The Right Time. So with Jerry Richardson out of the way, what do you think happens next? Uh, they'll sell it. They'll find a billionaire who wants to buy the place and keep it in Charlotte because Charlotte's a fairly groovy place to be. I mean, it ain't Miami. It ain't L.A., but uh, it's certainly comfortable, and there's a lot of money here, and there's a lot of young money moving to town. So uh, I think a lot of people locally are, are panicky about the possibility that it might move, especially after seeing an NBA team leave town before. But I, I just think if you look at the economics of the market, uh, that's probably an unfounded concern. I, I, I mean, just look at what happened in Buffalo. The last team to sell was the Bills. Uh, they were lined up around the corner to pay a billion four for a team in western New York with one of the worst stadiums in the NFL. So what's this place worth? I would think it's pretty valuable. Well, also, um, I would imagine that, I mean, Jerry had L.A. as the card to play for the longest and used that to get stadium upgrades and perks from the city. Right. L.A.'s not out there anymore as the threat. Right, and there really isn't. I mean, what is the threat? You know, San Diego, they don't have a stadium. That's why the Chargers aren't there. St. Louis, nobody's moving to St. Louis. No Fortune 500 companies are leaving Charlotte to move to St. Louis. That's an economic reality. So I don't know, you know, I don't know what the market would be, what the alternative would be. I really don't. I mean, I guess, you know, if the NFL needs its next stalking horse for these negotiations, East Bay, California would be the one. I mean, uh, from a market standpoint, not having a team in San Francisco slash Oakland, which I don't think you count Santa Clara as that market anymore. I mean, it's it's close, and they carry the same name, but it's a different locality. Uh, you know, that would be the one, but I don't think anybody's in any hurry to put another franchise in California at the moment. All right, talk to Darren Gander, Pro Football Talk, here on The Right Time. Now, also, this is interesting that as Jerry Richardson loses day-to-day control of his team, Jerry Richardson's famous favorite player, Thomas Davis, got a two-game suspension for that hit on Devontae Adams. What do you think about that? Uh, recidivism. I mean, Thomas got knocked 48 k for helmet-to-helmet uh, helmet earlier this year. And the next one, I mean, it's it's classic example of examples being made. Juju was going to get hit after that um Steelers Bengals game the other week. I mean, you just knew coming out of that game the next guy was going to get run up the flagpole. And after that, because it was such an egregious, I mean, I don't think it was malicious. I've known Thomas as long as he's been playing in the NFL. He didn't win that Walter Payton Man of the Year award for no reason. He's a good man, but that was a dirty play. I mean, he, he, it was helmet to helmet. It was blatant. The guy didn't see it coming. You know, it's it's like the rest of them. It it was two games. It, I'm sure when Derek Brooks and James Thrash hear the appeal, it'll get it'll get reduced down to one, and he'll be back out there on New Year's Eve against the Falcons. 
Now, I just mentioned, you know, Thomas Davis and his relationship with Jerry Richardson. But for other players on the team up until this point, what would you say was their perception of Jerry Richardson? Um, you know, different uh, among different people. And I think that was one of the more frustrating things for me about yesterday's scene post game is that Ron Rivera and all the players kept talking about all the nice things Jerry Richardson did for them. Well, yeah, because you're athletes and you're coaches and you can do something for him. It's all the other people in the building who can't do anything for him that I think that's the measure of your character. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people, I judge you based on how you treat the elderly and waitresses and dogs and people who can't do anything for you. And, and all these players lining up to tell stories about how Jerry Richardson was so nice to them. Well, yeah. I mean, you're the you're the one he would, and it's just, you know, it, it's going to be frustrating to me at a certain level if they go on this kick and, you know, get on a roll and want to win a Super Bowl for Mr. Richardson because, frankly, you know, based on the way his behavior is accused of behaving, he doesn't deserve that right now. Well, how nervous also is the NFL about what they might find? Oh, got to be. I mean, do, do you remember? Blue Apron is the leading meal kit delivery service in the U.S. And while many know what they do, not many know about the types of meals you eat when you cook with Blue Apron. Now tell me how these sound. Chili butter steaks with lemon parmesan butter and potatoes. Vegetable lo mein with bok choy and carrots. Spicy shrimp bucatani with cabbage and toasted breadcrumbs. Roasted chicken and maple butter with sweet mashed potato and collard greens. Blue Apron delivers fresh pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step recipes right to your door. They can be cooked in under 45 minutes. The menu changes every week based on what's in season and is designed by Blue Apron's in-house culinary team. Blue Apron offers 12 new recipes each week. Customers can pick two, three, four recipes based on what best fits their schedules and blue apron sends only non-gmo ingredients and meat without added hormones blue apron is treating our listeners on the right time to their first three meals free a 30 dollars value when you first order if you visit blueapron.com slash bomani so check out this week's new menu and get your 30 dollars off with free shipping at blueapron.com slash bomani blue apron a better way to cook Want an easy way to see if you could save money on car insurance? GEICO gives you three. Call 1-800-947-AUTO. Go online to GEICO.com or stop by the GEICO office nearest you. Three ways you could save 15% or more. Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. So yesterday I was out. uh, It was about the 1 o'clock hour. I'm going somewhere to watch some football. And I got a text that was like, you see this thing about Jerry Richardson? And I'm like, nah, send me a link on Jerry Richardson. And I get the Sports Illustrated story about Jerry Richardson. And I'm like, whoa, like this broke right around kickoff? So imagine that, Jerry Richardson at the game. It is sweet, whatever it is. And Sports Illustrated has dropped a bombshell report on him that talks about, among other things, four former Panthers employees who got confidential settlements based on inappropriate things that had happened at the workplace. It talked about a racial slur that had been directed at one African-American scout from the Panthers. Uh, and then they talked about, what was it, Jeans Day on Friday, where everyone would wear jeans to the office, and Jerry Richardson would come and make comments to women um, based on the jeans that they had. Shannon Wells, there? was it uh, Mr., right? Everybody at the Everybody calls him Mr.? An organization call him, refer to him as Mr. Yeah. Not Miss, not Mr. Richardson, to be clear, right? Just Mr. Like the color purple. Well, not exactly like the color purple, but like the color purple. They just call him Mr. Like it sounds like this wild, antiquated sort of workplace. Then there were more details, like the idea that, um, they said uh, allegedly Richardson would have an assistant like walk a woman to his suite and then he would get there and say things to him like you know i would love to shave your legs like you would love to shave their legs like that that's what we're doing here right so all of this happens after the game jerry richardson puts out a statement saying that he will in fact be selling the team but the statement of course made no level of apology for any of the allegations that were there in the report so If you were wondering when what's happening all over the rest of the world would get a little bit closer to sports, this is the moment where it has happened, right? Like it gets to an NFL team owner. I don't think there's anybody at this point who can be surprised to hear about any sector of life where this sort of thing comes to because this thing comes to kind of just like attitudes men have toward women and they're pretty pervasive everywhere. But now this has come to a place where like on the airwaves here and stuff like that, we wind up talking about it. I want to know who got Jerry Richardson on the phone that afternoon and was like, hey, we got this statement right here about how you're going to sell this team. Because you have to say today that you are going to sell this team. 
And shortly after that, you are probably going to need to say that you are not going to be involved in the day to day for this. And here's the reason. The NFL is saying right now that they are going to, uh, the Panthers had an, an internal investigation that was going on about Richardson. The NFL then took over that internal investigation as it has gone on. And I would imagine that the NFL would love nothing more than for Jerry Richardson to be long gone by the time the details of that investigation become clear. Or they would just like this to move fast enough that by the time they probably should have had an investigation, you might have forgot about it and moved on to something else because at that moment, they don't have to reckon with it. And the reckoning part of it as it comes to the NFL and where this gets to be interesting is what you do here effectively becomes the template if you have to do something else with some other team. You see what I mean? So dealing with this and whatever comes down, you got to deal with it, but you've got to keep in mind that whatever happens somewhere else that comes up is going to wind up having to be dealt with also. Now, for the NFL, 32 owners, right? I am not in a position here to say anything about how the owners get down on this. The richest story winds up being kind of two pronged. Because one thing I noticed, and Shannon, you tell me if you noticed this in the in the mentions, like on the Twitter mentions, because I noticed this. I had people who hit me up saying they wanted to talk about Jerry Richardson and the matters of gender involved. And then I had people hit me up and say they wanted to talk about Jerry Richardson as the racist owner. It was almost like a, like a, 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 a ink blot test, right? Of what people focus on. Like, did you notice that split? Absolutely. It was, it seemed, it was weird because it seemed like folks wanted to focus on one or the other. Right. But see, for the NFL, now you got both. Right. So if you have someone who feels they have been treated improperly at the workplace on the basis of race, then this is going to become the template for how that gets dealt with. If you had these issues of sexual harassment, then this becomes the template of how to be dealt with. And who are the people who are going to ultimately be behind determining what the course of action is on this? The other owners. Now, to a degree, we are asking those other owners, at least some of them, one might presume, to pick their own switch. Right. Because whatever happens to the Panthers, if you are in a similar situation, then that's going to come down on you wherever it is. You remember when um, what was it uh, with Donald Sterling, when the NBA ran Donald Sterling out of there? And remember, they ran Donald Sterling out of there for something very, very particular. Right. What those statements were that he got caught saying to the woman that then got broadcast. They didn't get him for like the overall culture. Keeping in mind, there have been allegations that Donald Sterling was bringing people to watch the dude shower. And all the things that Sterling had been alleged to have said at all these different points. They didn't get him for that. They got him for that one particular thing. And getting him for that one particular thing kind of made it easy for him to a degree because you couldn't go and look at every other team and see how they get down and then say, okay, this is what we're going to do. They were like, no, we're getting you for this one thing. If they're going to get the Panthers or Richardson, whoever it is, for the larger culture that's there, then all these teams understand that their cultures are open doors for the league if they want to give some level of punishment. So then if you are the owners, how do you decide what this punishment is? You're picking your own, like I say, they get to pick their own switch. How are they going to do it? But no, oh, it's Mark Cuban. You remember when Mark Cuban did that interview where he was trying to explain that all of us have our impulses on rate. You know, like he said, if I see a white dude with a face full of tattoos or a black kid with a hoodie, I'm going to be scared either way. And we need to understand and have a dialogue and a conversation or anything. That was one of those. Cause he was like, no, we shouldn't take Donald Sterling's team. Cause he's like, Hey man, you never know when that mirror, at least it felt like you never know when that's going to spin back around and you never know when it's going to hit you. So what's the NFL going to do? In the end with this, what are they going to do? Not sure. I'd also like to point out something else that's very interesting. Shane, did you, did you notice this? It doesn't seem like anybody was able to get a microphone in Jerry Richardson's face or any other suit's face, so they had to come talk to the rank and file. Football players and the coach. And I can imagine that's probably the last thing that Jerry, that uh, Ron Rivera wanted to talk about. Well, also think about it from this standpoint, too, right? So... Like, all companies have their public relations wings or whatever, right? And you send the publicists out to take the bullets for everybody. That's not what happens in sports. We send the players and we send the coaches out there to talk about these things. And what does that mean when we talk about the Carolina Panthers? That's right. We need to get an answer from Cam Newton. Now, I imagine that there had to be some public relations person with the Panthers whose job it was to try, try to get, like, Cam like what what we're going to try to do. But also, Shannon, what do you do if you're the public relations person? Because as of right now, you still work for Jerry Richardson. Right? 
At the same time, I'd imagine that you you, you give uh, Cam the heads up and try to keep it as vague as possible. Yeah, but also keep in mind, this happened during, on game day, right? So it's not like they had all night to send Cam home with some flashcards or something to think about this or whatever. No, they're catching him after the game wearing that ridiculous hat in those shades. Like, nobody told him, hey, Cam, we're going to have to talk about some serious stuff, man. You might want to take that uh, Aladdin hat off there. Nope, he's up there with the Aladdin hat. Didn't he have some, like, funny-looking glasses? Like, could have been, like, from Tom Petty into the Great Wide Open video. They had, like, a tent to him. But anyway... There's Cam. Uh, he was up there, and you could tell as he started talking, like, man, I hope I don't mess this up. Play the first one. I heard about it, but I haven't, you know, really dug into it. Um, and I just recently, you know, seen the, the internal investigation about all that. But, you know, one thing about it, man, um, you know, Mr. Richardson has been an unbelievable source in my life. You know, I can't really speak on nobody else, but I have conversations that because in my life, it's hard for me to kind of talk to certain people with them not being able to understand where I'm coming from. And I found a place of um, a refuge, you know, with Mr. Rick. Instead of going to college, I got did special forces in the military. I got out, got that vocational rehabilitation money from the from the military decided, you know what? I think I'm going to play college ball. I got out of the military in the great state of Virginia and decided that I wanted to go into engineering. So I figured, what's the best engineering school in Virginia but Virginia Tech? Um, fortunately, I was going there during the same time that a certain member of a certain second secondary out in Seattle was going there. And I was on the scout team as a fullback. <clears throat> Went out, caught a pass in the flat, and got hit so hard that the rest of the story is coming to you from secondhand information because I don't remember any of it. I am told that I walked to the defensive huddle, put my hands on my knees, and said, that mf -er can hit. <laughs> and at that time, I was directed back to the offensive huddle, and the only other thing that I got to say is if you could put a piece of paper between the ball and the pole, then obviously they didn't get that first down. The Cowboys robbed the Raiders again. And with that, I'll take it off the air. Well, Steve, I appreciate the call. There it is. If you ever imagine what it felt like to get hit by Cam Chancellor, ask Steve. And Steve will tell you what other people told you about it. Cam was out there hitting fullbacks? Fullbacks. Fullbacks. Was he an undersized fullback? Because that's the thing. And I think I'm about to be on the scout team as the undersized fullback. You got me. <laughs> Hell no. The right time with Bomani Jones. All guests join us on the Shell Pencil Performance Line, just like our next guest. I sat in front of him at a meeting last week. Super Bowl champion Ryan Clark. Uh, Ryan, what what was going on with the Steelers at the end of that game, man? They got to find some way to play defense. I think um, I like what they tried to do. They went man-to-man, -man, press coverage. Uh, which is what you had to do against Tom Brady, disrupt him, get pressure with four. But there at the end of the game, you see that he's targeting Rob Gronkowski every chance he gets. He feels like he's the one guy that can win against man-to-man. -man. I like for them to do something different to take Tom Brady off of his first initial read, which is Rob Gron Gronkowski. And then you go to the, the fake spike and the slant. I like going for it there, and especially after you feel like you've already won the game with the Jesse James touchdown that was overturned. And so I like going for it there, giving your team an opportunity to win the game. But once he gets through that first window and you can't fit the ball in on the slant, I think it would be better to throw it away, give yourself a field goal, and now you get a chance in overtime to at least compete to try to win the game. Yeah, well, what did you think about him after the game making it clear to everyone that he wanted to spike it? He's a bit of an oversharer. <laughs> um, you know, uh, he kind of, you know, passed the, the buck a little bit. I think in a situation like that, you just like to go with, you know what, that's the play we called. Uh, I was trying to win the game, and, and, and so be it. But, you know, that's part of kind of who Ben is. You know, he's a guy who's told us about injuries when that's something you say you really don't want to do. He's a guy who's very open and actually answers the questions with what he feels is the correct the correct answer. And so you're going to have some of those situations that kind of make you shake your head, and that is one of them for sure. We're talking to Ryan Clark, VSPN, here on The Right Time. Now, were the Steelers in a position where they could have run an actual play rather than just the fake spike? 
I'm not sure if they could have got, gotten one called. Obviously, with the fake spike, everybody lined up. You can see Ben kind of giving Eli, Eli Rogers some type of signal. I'm not sure in that situation, unless you know what play you want from that position or you call two plays before the last, I guess, repeat the next one. You know, there were other things you could do, but actually get a new play call, get a play call that uh, – everybody understands and knows would have probably been a little bit harder and you'd have been scared that you take too much time doing that and don't get a fourth down if you don't convert. Now, I try not to get too caught up in, like, the narrative stuff about, you know, momentum and the likes and everything else, but how important would it have been for the Steelers just to get a win over the Patriots? Because I can't remember the last time it happened. It would have been huge. It would have been huge, just psychologically, especially with this group of men, with the team that they have. There's been so many defeats defeats at the hand of Bill Belichick and at the hand of Tom Brady that to actually get a win without your best player, without a guy who had an opportunity to be the MVP of the league in Antonio Brown would have been huge psychologically. But also when you look at where the playoffs would have to go through, which would have been Heinz Field, or at least put the Steelers in the lead for it to be Heinz Field, it would have been the biggest win of the season if you can count a regular season win that important. We're talking to Ryan Clark of ESPN here on The Right Time. Now, how much will it hurt them in these next two weeks? Like, is winning without Antonio Brown something they can do? I mean, you got to look at who they're playing, right? I mean, you get the old Browns, you get the old uh, Texans. Ah, You know, those are two teams who are very beatable. And listen, here's why, and I said it during the season, when Martavis Bryant was asking to be traded, I said, you do not trade him. I said, I don't care if you got to sit in the rest of the year. You never know what can happen. You never know what you need. This dude is a physical stud, and now you need him. You see him last night making big pe- making big catches on the fade route against uh, against the, the Patriots. You see him make a huge one-handed grab in the end zone. And so you see the talent. You see the things he can do. You add Juju Smith-Schuster to that. You know you have Le'Veon Bell. So you have a team that can go out and really compete not only against these two teams that they play, but compete against playoff team offensively with the firepower that they still have. So this team will be fine. I expect them to win these next two games and have themselves in position for a bye, which then allows Antonio Brown another week to recover without them playing. All right, talk to Ryan Clark of ESPN here on the right time. Now, switching gears just a little bit, uh, how about that Blake Bortles? Hey, man, listen, I have been on record saying Blake Bortles is not very good. He's a little bit better than I thought. I'm not going to say he's great. He was playing against the the Texans, but he finally threw the ball with some authority. Even in the last two weeks when he's actually played well, uh, they've gotten out in front defensively. they run the ball well. You didn't, you, you didn't believe in the throws. Last week he was stepping into the throw, stepping up in the pocket, making smart decisions, throwing balls into st- tight spots and tight places. And that's what you need to see out of Blake Bortles to give you any confidence you can compete with the teams you'll play against in the, in the playoffs. And so for them, it is definitely looking up, but I'm not ready to say that Blake Bortles is, as Leonard Fournette said, a top five quarterback in this league. You sound like me talking about Kirk Cousins on this one. Like, yeah, okay, he ain't as bad as I thought he was, but y'all trip. <laughs> We're going to talk to Ryan Clark of ESPN here on The Right Time. Uh, switching gears just a little bit, what do you think about the Thomas Davis hit getting a two-game suspension? Um. I understand what the NFL is trying to do here. Here's a guy who was fined 48000 early on in the year for a very similar hit, and now you are clearly helmet-to-helmet contacting Devontae Adams, the guy who we've seen uh, be hit in compromising positions already both last year and this. I don't mind the suspension in a vacuum. Okay, we're trying to legislate this play out of the game. I mind the suspension when Mike Evans got the same suspension for blindsiding Marshawn Lattimore after the play when he's fussing with Jameis Winston, when Gronkowski can do uh, uh, the people's elbow on Tredavious White and only get one game. I have an issue with it when uh, Crabtree and Tlaib get into a fist fight in a game, pull off helmets, pull chains, and they only get two. If all of these things that are away from football, outside of the game, are penalized in the same way or actually less than Thomas Davis, then I have an issue. All right, talk because to okay. I understand player safety is important, but now you're starting to say that you're going to legislate things that are just football even more than other things that aren't. 
All right, last question for Brian Clark of ESPN here on The Right Time. Did guys around the league have any whispers about the Panthers and Jerry Richardson and what the environment was around that franchise? No, you know, I, I really haven't heard anything about the environment around uh, the franchise, but I've dealt with him. We've dealt with him as the NFL PA. Uh, we know who Jerry Richardson is. Uh, the allegations that deal with racism and racial slurs do not surprise me. Uh, I'm not saying that the um, that the allegations of the way he treated women uh, does surprise me, but that's not necessarily something I can say I saw from his behavior or I've been told from the way that he's interacted with people. But I definitely know that him using a racial slur is neither surprising uh, to me or far off from what I thought he would do. All right, hey, that is Ryan Clark. Check him out covering the NFL for us here at ESPN. Stay warm, my man. I'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Today is the day that my good buddy Shannon Penn has been looking forward to it for a very long time. I feel like he's been really looking forward to this his whole life. Even if he didn't realize he's been looking forward to this his whole life. This is the day that Kobe Bryant is honored by the Lakers by having his jersey retired not once but twice because he has two numbers, and so they are going to retire number 8 and number 24. Keep it in mind, Shannon, Willis Reed and Dick Barnett have to share number 15 for the uh for the Knicks, right? Or Earl Monroe, rather. Earl Monroe and Dick Barnett. They right. had to share number 15 for the Knicks. Kobe gets two numbers for himself. How you feel about that? I, I tried my best just now. I really did. I tried my best not to roll my eyes when you said he was having two two numbers retired. I really did. But I guess it makes sense, though, right? To have Go ahead, Jersey's number retired. Go ahead, Shannon. Oh, I'm, I'm, that, 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 that's all I have. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find something nice to say about Kobe. Maybe I'll find it by the end of the segment. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking about you, like being a cat from Virginia. I just know that you have to have all kinds of respect for the way that in the 2001 NBA Finals, Kobe put them clamps on Allen Iverson, shut that situation down to help the Lakers get to a five-game win. I'm sure that all you boys in Virginia were very mm-hmm. happy about that, right, Kobe? Yeah. I mean, Shannon? Yeah, no one remembers the 2001 Finals games two through five. The only thing we remember from 2001 is that one game – that one victorious game that the Sixers and Allen Iverson had with uh, Iverson stepping over Toronto. That's all we remember. That's the most memorable moment of the 2001 Finals. Yeah, but you remember the rest of it, Shannon. Mm-hmm. Being a big Kobe fan like you were, that's when you who? came to respect who? him as a top-notch defender. Wait, wait, who? Who? You're not a Kobe fan? What? No, me? Me? Oh, 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 no. Oh, no. That's... That's not not gonna happen. I'm gonna I'm trying I'm trying, but I really did. I knew we were gonna talk about Kobe today because they're retiring his jer- jersey numbers, not one but two. And I tr- I'm trying my best to find something positive. I am I am on the mission right now, and I will find something positive to talk well, about. Kobe. Well, go ahead and tell the people mm-hmm. about the Twitter poll that you oh. put up about Kobe. Oh well, I'm glad that you asked. We actually have two uh, Twitter polls right now on the ESPN Radio Twitter account. The first being in the Kobe system commercial with Kanye West, who was in on the joke, Kobe. Kanye, both or neither. If you remember, that was the more when when Kanye set, kept saying, but I'm the best, and Kobe was like, more. Are you the same beast in a different animal, whatever yes. Kobe system thing he said. And then the other poll that we have on the ESPN Radio Twitter account, with the Lakers retiring the Black Mamba's numbers 8 and, jer- and 24 jerseys, who was the best snake of all time? <laughs> what? He, gave, he, he gave himself the nickname, right? The Black Mamba. So, snake shed it. So, yeah, the snake gave himself his own nickname. <laughs> so the options were uh, Kobe Bryant, Jake the Snake Roberts, Ken Stabler, or Cobra Commander. So feel free to go on the ESPN Radio Twitter account and vote on who was the best snake ever. <laughs> best what? Right now, right now, Kobe is leading the ESPN Radio Twitter poll at 33% when we asked who was the best snake of all time. <laughs> the best what, Shannon? The best snake of all time. <laughs> why, 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 why snake? Because he gave himself that own, his own nickname. Can't do that in these streets. Sorry. There is something so funny about when someone decides to call somebody else a snake. I don't know what it is about calling somebody a snake. That's so funny. You ever hear Poppy who calls LeBron and LeBron and Wade the Snake Brothers? Well, the S Snake Brothers. This is a first for me. No. Yeah, he says that Wade was a snake for the way he left Miami, and that LeBron was a snake for the way he left Miami. So they are the Snake. They say he said the Warriors are the Splash Brothers. They are the Snake Brothers. Oh, man. So, Kobe, you know, we got the things here. Everybody's doing that. Well, Kobe was better, the number eight Kobe, or the number 24 Kobe. And, you see, the tricky thing about the number 24 Kobe is the number 24 Kobe has that back end, like the the bad Kobe years. And I feel like that kind of stunts what we're really talking about with this. I will tell you this, though, um, from looking at the differences between the number eight Kobe and number 24 Kobe, 
So shooting efficiency, right? Number eight, Kobe, 45% from the field. Number 24, Kobe, 44% from the field. Number eight, Kobe, 33.6% from three. Um, number 24, Kobe, 32.5% from three. Uh, Shannon, I, I see that and I'm like, wow, I thought Kobe was a better shooter than that. Kobe put up a lot of shots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm feeling like the combination of these two, I, I would have expected better than like, low 30s from three point range i would have thought that was that was what we have like i'm 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 going to be honest that i keep seeing all these numbers for kobe with eight and 24 it all it leads me to think is wow he's no lebron james that's right i said it but, Bo, he's uh, just ask a Kobe stand. He was the best player of his generation, though, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. there's no number that supports that fact, right? Like, if you like Kobe like that, it's cool, but there really is no statistical case to support that fact. You have the ring count. I guess you could call that a stat, but there's nothing else there. But, see, the thing about Kobe is I feel like we lose the point when we kind of start talking about Kobe in comparison to LeBron and everybody else. I feel like you have to view Kobe in the context of the Lakers, and he is theirs, and they love him, and they have the right to absolutely love him, but they need to love him in in a local sort of way, right? Like he is the bridge between the Shaq, I mean, it's the Shaq Kobe era, but he's the bridge of that time. They, that low point they had in the middle, he got them back to a championship level of contention there. He has been the center of this for who knows how long. And in LA, they absolutely 100% love him to death. They love his dirty draws and they are allowed to love Kobe's dirty draws, but just say that you love him. Don't try to force the rest of us into believing that he was a little better at this than he actually was. He is one of the greatest basketball players of all time. He is, no question, absolutely, 100%, a Hall of Famer. And he is a Lakers legend. And I think all of those things are very good and very nice to say. And as I've said many times about Kobe, I respect Kobe. I respect the way that he has no fear of failure. I totally respect the fact that he is willing to deal with the consequences of whatever goes wrong because he's not afraid, and very few of us are like that. Shannon, you gonna say something nice about Kobe? All right, I just figured. I just thought about what I, what nice thing I'm gonna say about Kobe Bryant. This is, this is genuine, coming from the heart. Um, I seriously, Bob, no, stop laughing. This this is serious. I'm, I'm being I'm being real right now. I, I, the thing I admired most about Kobe Bryant is that I wish I worked at something as hard and as much as Kobe did with basketball. See? There you go, Look Shannon. That. that was nice, wasn't it? Like work this hard is putting up all them shots in the last game, so you can put up what he scored fifty points or whatever it was. So you, I think it was sixty. So you, he scored sixty. Really? I think it was sixty. Oh my gosh! I also oh, think never he, mind. I also think he, I also think he took sixty shots. The right time with Bomani Jones. All guests join us on the Shell Pizzo Performance Line, just like our next guest. Check him out at SBNation.com, EDSBS.com. The best college football writer in America. His name is Spencer Hall. Uh, Spencer, did you get caught in the Atlanta airport? Power shut down. I missed it by a day, which is good because I can't really emphasize enough the, the the desperation of the situation. When I tell you this, it happened on a Sunday, and Chick Fil A sprung into action. Let me remind you of the previous time when Chick Fil A has sprung into action on a Sunday in the name of a community event. Never, never. Chick Fil A is closed on Sundays. If you want to eat one, you got to buy it late, put it in your pocket. Keep it warm there and pull it out at 12.01 a.m. That's how bad it got. I've been very curious about the discussions at Chick-fil-A behind this one. Like, did they have to call in an apology first? They they had to. They had to do this. They probably did this. They probably said, listen, we'll use the international date line to justify this. This is coming from the Hawaii office or from, from our, our Tokyo location. However, they had to do it in order to justify it because – uh, it was bad. There's people on planes for eight hours, eight hours from one fire that took out an entire airport. Atlanta, you know, The Walking Dead really isn't so much about Atlanta after a zombie attack. It's at, about Atlanta after pretty much anything, like a simple event. Well, let me tell you this, too. The thought of being on a plane for eight hours almost guarantees I never fly coach again because I can't imagine how much I'd hate everyone around me after eight hours on a plane and coach. You know, after eight hours, your, your phone runs out of juice. Right, like that's how that's how bad it gets. The drink cart is empty after eight hours. After eight hours, you already know everyone's stories, and you're tired of them. Unless someone's got cards and and, and money to put on the table, I, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of amusement there. 
it was it was not a good situation. And if it happened before the college football title game, it would be a very bad situation. Also, is anybody crankier in that circumstance than the uh, flight attendants? Uh, you know, or maybe the pilots, because I, I can't imagine the pilots enjoy that too much because everyone else, they used to go in about 70 miles an hour on the road. Pilots, they used to go in about, you know, 500. So sitting still, I don't think they enjoyed it either. We're talking to Spencer Hall, EDSBS.com, here on The Right Time. All right, are you ready, by the way, for the site that will be Georgia, Oklahoma, at the Georgia, well, not the Georgia Dome, we don't do that anymore, Mercedes-Benz? Oh, at the Benz. Yeah, that'd be that'd be Georgia and Oklahoma. And my favorite thing is this, that, that Oklahoma fans, they travel real well, right? They do. Uh, Oklahoma fans, too. They, there's a little bit of country mouse to them, so they have some really interesting places in Atlanta, right? Like, should I go there? Uh, you know what that Uber driver is going to say? Do you want me to take you there? <laughs> I, I don't know. You can you can go there if you want, and that's when and that's when you see Oklahoma hats in the weirdest places. I'm thinking of all the places I want to see them in, and not sure how many of them I can say by name on the radio. We're, we're delving into not we're delving into like FCC territory. Um, I, I will say this: if Georgia wins, then again for the second time this year, the most common name going into the Fulton County Jail's. Uh, uh, like record, that guy's name like you know Thad, right? <laughs> a lot of ads, a lot of Brads, a lot of Chads, right? A lot of Thompsons, a lot of guys with last names for first names, right? And really nice button downs. Just going in there because too full, too full of that dog spirit, right? A little too rowdy. <laughs> We're talking to Spencer Hall of EDSBS dot com here on the right time. Now the game itself. Can Georgia slow down Oklahoma's offense? I don't think so, and, and that's. That's fine because I really doubt that Oklahoma is going to be able to put up much in the way of resistance to Georgia's rushing attack, right? And that to me says that when you look at, well, one defense isn't going to re- really put up much resistance against another and the other one's just going to get run over. Okay. So, so what's our sort of linchpin here, right? What does this whole thing hinge on? And I think that's going to have to come down to Georgia's quarterback situation, right? At, at one point, you know, like, they can't hide that. They, they have to rely on Jake Fromm, and they have to let him do some stuff, right? And that was, by the way, one thing that they did, you know, pretty well in both Auburn games. I know, like, he got beat up in that first Auburn game. Jake Fromm, Jake Fromm played pretty well. He's going to have to play even better, and I think he'll have the chance to because once they get that play-action game going down, I think anyone has seen at Oklahoma secondary, there's a hole back there. They're going to be able to – take some shots and and do some big things. I think it's going to be a blowout. I I really hope so because I really don't want to watch another, like, 17-10 game in one of these. Nope, I want it, like, 42-38 running up and down the field, and whoever gets the ball last wins. If that's Baker Mayfield, by the way, game over because I just trust Baker Mayfield to either do what he's supposed to do, i.e. get them in the end zone, or do something spectacularly bad. Either way, that's entertainment. Well, how did Georgia go from having Jacob Eason last year and thinking a quarterback of the future to now where they have a quarterback that needs to be hidden, but it's not Jacob Eason? Well, yeah. I mean, And by the way, I don't think he needs to be hidden, right? They've been pretty conservative with him, and I think that's a smart thing to do. He's really good, man. He's phenomenal. He's good enough to have unseated Eason, right, after Eason's injury earlier this year, and, and, and Eason never saw the starting gig again. That's how good Frome was, right? And the most impressive thing when you watch Frome, by the way, the little things like checks and checking the runs and getting his protections right and, and not being stupid, right? You, you Don't be careless. When you're a quarterback and, and you're a first-year starter, the most important thing you can do is not mess up. And Fromm is really good at not messing up, but he's much better than that. I don't want to poor mouth him. I think he's exceptional. Uh, the guy who's really going to make your eyes boggle, though, um, he's wearing crimson and cream on the other side. It's Baker Mayfield. Also, by the way, Kirby Smart has become the new Kevin Sumlin. Quarterbacks, I'll take them all. They got another one coming next year. Oh, sure. Listen, man, the trans- the transfer quarterback, everyone's friend in college football now. If we really loosened up those transfer rules, whew, we could have some, some proper charming vagabonds, right? Starting one year here, starting one year at another. Just taking a tour, like a little sort of study abroad thing. We're talking to Spencer Hall, EDSBS.com, here on The Right Time. All right, Clemson, Alabama, is it weird feeling like, ooh, I don't think Alabama can pull this one off? It's a little weird feeling that way. Um, I think it also feels weird to me because, you know, I don't feel like Clemson's there yet. (laughs) I don't think, like, I think defensively they're there, right? But the ceiling for Kelly Bryant, a quarterback, is, is much higher 
th- than what he's played at this year, right? Like he's just getting started, and they're already pretty good. Like I, it's weird seeing two teams where you go, I already want to see next year, right? I feel like both of these teams are, are here a year early because of the massive amount of talent that they have on the roster, right? So I feel like that'll be the less satisfying game because I don't think either of these teams are sort of in peak condition. I don't think that they're necessarily ready or the best versions of those teams. And it is very weird to say that about Alabama, right? And I know Alabama fans put this on on the offensive coordinator, Brian Double, first. Uh, Who really knows who the offensive coordinator is at Alabama, right? Like, they have a firm. That's a firm. That's like... It's like blaming Warren Buffett for something. You're like, okay, listen, Warren Buffett's head of a corporation. <laughs> Nick Saban is head of a corporation, and that is a division in that corporation. So who knows, really, who's responsible for some of the offensive foibles? Two, I know a lot of people in Alabama want to put it on Jalen Hurts, and they want to say, oh, listen, man, that guy's like just not getting it done at quarterback. It's really not fair to take a quarterback who you let throw like 15 times max, get behind in a game and say, well, go out there and throw it 40 times. Get, get us back in the game, Jalen, come on. That's not that's not what you've done as a mode, as a team. That's not what you've done all year. It's really unfair to get in that situation and immediately look at that guy and go, well, I don't know, make something happen, right? He's not Baker Mayfield, and he hasn't been coached to be Baker Mayfield, right? Not yet, at least. Well, the one good thing for Alabama is I don't think anybody's going to benefit more from rest, right, from having guys get healed up. Oh, no, and, and that, that's another thing. The linebacking court you know, took a shellacking. Uh, with injury. And if you look at the games that, that they struggled in, right, if you look at them losing to Auburn, a lot of those plays, a lot of those plays happened because of falling for shifts, motions, various kind of fakes that really got linebackers moving one way and then they ran through that hole on the other side. That doesn't happen when you have experience. That doesn't happen when you have a healthy Alabama linebacking court. So they'll benefit from that, right? If this ends up being a low-scoring game, you know, Alabama will be totally happy with that all day long. If it starts getting up into like the 20s and 30s, that's when they start getting nervous. All right, that is Spencer Hall. Check him out at SBNation.com, EDSBS.com. Thanks so much, my man. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thanks for listening to The Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to The Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.